And now Fabian Bolin will take the stage. Thank you. Thank you. I think Just trying to get the... Uh, can we have the slides up for Fabian, please? Ah, oh, there we go. Something's changing, so maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, hopefully. What? Well, there we go. Looks like it. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Hello, my friends, family, and followers. On the 1st of July, I was diagnosed with leukemia. For those of you who are not familiar with this term, it's blood cancer. I've been feeling down under the weather for one, two months. My body felt exhausted and my mood low. I simply put this down to inflated levels of stress and hard work. Today I've completed my first chemotherapy session and I have several more to come. I've been told that the treatment will affect my energy levels and destroy my immune system. There's a risk that I will not survive. I feel so utterly sad and confused right now. Lots of love to you all, Fabian. So um, I'm going to be cautiously bold here and start with uh, a question. How many ha of you have heard the phrase, we have to involve the patients? Please raise your hands. I, uh, I assume so. We are uh, we're hearing it a lot, uh, especially when dealing with healthcare. Uh, at health conferences, panel discussions, seminars, and um, uh, see senior executives talking about the fact that we need to digitalize the, the treatment schedule and, and the patient must be able to, to chat or get in touch with a doctor via email and not having to call. And I mean, don't get me wrong, it's, uh, it's great that we are, uh, the healthcare is now starting to understand the value of involving the patients. However, I think there's a danger in, in uh, the assumption that involving the patient, at least the way they are referring to it, is the solution to the whole problem. Um, I think that involving the patients only scratches the surface of a much more deeply rooted problem for cancer patients. And it's the fact that patients, as well as family, are fighting a mental trauma whilst undergoing the treatments as well as afterwards. I know because as you see, I, uh, I'm a cancer patient. I, um, in December, I just finished a 900 days long chemotherapy session for leukemia. And as you can see, the body heals, but it's the mind that takes most of the damage. And yet not a single, yet even though I think most people within the healthcare knows about this, not a single doctor or nurse has ever asked me the question, how do you feel? Now, I don't blame them personally. It's not like I think that nurses or doctors are less sympathetic people, probably the opposite, because they, they, uh, they want to work with this. But the problem is of a more structural nature and comes from within the healthcare. The problem is that mental health is being overlooked. So if we, instead of asking ourselves, how can we, we involve the patients, dare to ask the real question, which is how can we boost mental health for patients? Then I think it would have le led to a much more interesting conversation. First of all, you would have to uh, distinguish between mental illness and mental health. And secondly, it would lead to a, a discussion, I think, where you would ask, is the healthcare really responsible for mental health, or should they perhaps be working together with a third-party platform, a platform that can unite 
the patients and also help the healthcare better understand the needs. So I'm the CEO and co-founder of such a platform and it's called War on Cancer. Before I go into uh, more details on, on what we're building and um, the vision, let me first talk to you or tell you the story that led up to this and the reason why I'm standing here on this stage. So if we uh, wind the clock back about three, just over three years, uh, it feels like looking at a different person. I see a person, I see myself living in London, and uh, I had actually managed to, during the years that I was living there, I, I managed to shift the career from investment banking, I was trading bonds, to a new one within the film industry. And whilst that was um, by far the most hectic period in my life, uh, most competitive, I felt like I was making progress in this new career. And uh, it even uh, led to the fact that I, um, I started lining up work and uh, I got a visa to work in the States. So I was just uh, planning to, to make the big move out to, to the US. But this was around the time when I started feeling tired. This was in May 2015. And not just a little tired, but exhausted. And I uh, blamed it on stress and a lot of hard work, and I, I started to suspect maybe that, that I'm burning out. So uh, I decided to do nothing and just sort of wait it out. And uh, this, this, ex this tiredness grew into an exhaustion, and uh, I remember that I started aching and sweating uh, after a couple of weeks uh, on a daily basis. And... Uh, but I knew that I was flying home to see my parents in Stockholm, Sweden, where I'm from. So um, it was on the very same day that I got there where uh, when I landed and met my parents, I hadn't seen them for maybe nine months. And uh, I told them instantly that I, uh, I think I need to go to the hospital because I can't breathe. And I had this growing, growing pain in my chest. Um, that, couldn't, that didn't go away. So we went to the hospital, and I got a scan. And two days later, I was informed that I had uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And I remember those, uh, those moments clearly, the, the few seconds after I had been diagnosed, uh, before the doctors had a chance to really say anything else. And, and uh, that was a couple of moments when I was certain I was gonna die, because quite frankly, blood cancer the only thing I'd been exposed to, for cancer, is from the charities and the, the galas. And it's, it's not usually painting the most positive picture. And especially blood. I felt to myself, well, the blood is running through my veins. And if I, if I had cancer, I'm going to die. Uh, but only seconds later, the doctors told me that you're standing a pretty good chance of surviving. You're standing a 60 to 70% chance of surviving this. And I was sort of rocked out of this surreal feeling of knowing that I was going to die back to reality. And the first thing that I felt was frustration when they told me that you're looking at a two and a half year long treatment. And the first thing that, that I felt, I was 28 at the time, I said, well, it feels like my life's ruined. Everything that I've worked for, my career, what's going to happen with that? And I also asked them, well, okay, I want to I I try and live my life to the fullest, even though I'm un undergoing cancer treatment. So I need to know how I can eat in a better way and how I can exercise to maximize my chances of surviving and feeling healthy. And that was the first time I really encountered the un unwillingness and the incapacity from doctors to talk to patients because I was told to eat whatever makes you happy. And it's, I mean, and, and regarding exercise, they said focus on resting. And to me, that felt, frankly, belittling. And, and also, to be honest, pretty dangerous. I mean, you don't even say that to a healthy person. So why do you say that to someone who's been diagnosed with cancer? So I did what, um, what many other patients do. I, uh, I went online. 
I started Googling for a bit, and uh, I mean, uh, Googling cancer and diets, for instance, today, gives about 300 million hits. It's a bit overwhelming. So I took a different strategy, because what I really felt was I want to find someone in a similar situation. If I can just connect with someone undergoing this, maybe a couple of months ahead of me, or a couple of, maybe a year ahead of me, then I can ask this person the questions. And um, I used social media to, um, to find this person. I shared a message. Uh, I told people about the situation, and I asked whether people could help me share. And as you can see, it wasn't just my close friends and family that helped me share this. Almost 13,000 people shared it over 24 hours. And what followed was, to me, the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced. So thousands and thousands of people from everywhere, from all over the world, sent their love and support through messages to me. So many people started sharing their experiences, sending loads of advice. And what I also noticed was there was so much gratefulness. Because many of them started with saying, thank you for sharing. I'm going through the same thing as you. And just so you know, your sharing is helping me. So I instantly understood that there's such a need for stories about cancer because they can help. And it seems like everyone is connected one way or the other. So I decided to, I decided to share my journey. I uh, started a blog called Fabian Bolin's War on Cancer. And in that blog, I shared openly what I was going through and truthfully. And to me, that became my savior because I could share everything from the nightmare that I was dealing with on a daily basis, going back and forth to the hospital, from all the thoughts, all the things processing in my head, to dealing with my parents' fear of losing their own son. And I can deal with it openly, and I knew that by doing so, I'm helping others as well, which is, in fact, in turn, helped me. So about a month in, the blog had grown to more than 200,000 monthly readers, many of them cancer patients and people affected by cancer themselves. And I felt to myself, we need to do something more than this. I mean, a blog is just a blog, and it will fade away eventually. What if we could do this? This, this thing that I'm feeling, that I'm helping people, that, that should be spread to more people. So together with one of my closest friends, Sebastian, who is sitting here somewhere in the audience, um, and he had been with me almost from day one just talking to me, um, I said, we need to build something larger out of war on cancer. And together we decided that, okay, well, let's start with building a portal for storytelling. Let's build a platform where people like yourself, who are okay to share openly what you're going through, can unite. Your story alone has helped thousands of people cope with their journey. Imagine what a whole platform would do. And that was the idea and the, the, the birth of War on Cancer, dot com. We launched in May 2016, and over within a couple of weeks, we, uh, the blog portal had grown to more than 22 countries. We had storytellers from more than 22 countries covering more than 35 forms of cancer. And interestingly enough, add a third out of these were not patients. They were loved ones. A husband, a wife, a mother sharing their experiences going through cancer from the carer's point of view. So we understood that, that the problem isn't just limited to patients when it comes to the mental aspect of things. It's, it's a whole team around the patient being affected. So with this platform, we started to get some recognition. Uh, and we were approached by, this was the first time we were approached by the industry. We were asked to fly down to the European MedTech Forum in 2016 uh, and speak in front of, um, of the industry about the platform. And to be, to be honest, I mean, we're not coming from the healthcare. We're both coming from the business angle. And so we had to Google MedTech on the way down, uh, because we thought it was healthcare, but apparently it was, it's, it's completely different. 
Uh, and we didn't pretend to know that we knew what we were talking about more than the fact that we talked about our vision. We said we want to build a platform that can help people cope with what they're going through, and we want to unite people globally. And we hope that on this platform, people will no longer be seen as victims, but as heroes. And I think it resonated well. Because not only did we get in touch with uh, Microsoft, I think, Elena, you might be in here somewhere, because we met, and you said, we want to work together with you. But we also got in touch with healthcare and with pharmaceutical companies that said to us that not only can this platform truly help when it comes to mental, the mental challenge which is fighting cancer, but also there's a huge potential value in the patient reported data that you can collect. So we understood then and there that, okay, the possibility of matching patients with clinical trials, the possibility of healthcare easier understanding the needs of patients could be realized through the platform. But we also understood that, okay, we need to ditch what we have built because a blog portal will never do the job. We started thinking, we did about 100 interviews with patients, with people from the healthcare, and together with a team of programmers, as well as senior UX designers, we are about to launch War on Cancer, the app. On War on Cancer, a social platform for people fighting cancer, patients, survivors, and loved ones. The members are free to share their journeys or follow others similar to the Instagram style. Share health data and track your impact, and I'm gonna get back to that later. Boost your health literacy. Understand how you can cope with cancer from others, real experiences. And the last thing is build your tribe. Form a group of people, friends, close ones, to follow you on the journey. Now, we could stop here. And by the way, this is launching on June 30 as, a, as an early version. Uh, we could stop with the app, but we want to take this further. Because we believe that to really make a proper change, we need to work with the industry, and we need to engage in co-creation. So this is a... Uh, this slide shows how we intend to work together with healthcare. We have launched a co-creation project, a pilot project together with Salgrinska University Hospitals, and we're talking with Karolinska right now. And the idea is simple. We provide a platform that can take care of mental health, that can help healthcare dealing with the mental aspects of, of, uh, for their patients. And we, by collecting a large number of patients, we can help healthcare better understand the needs of patients, patient-reported outcomes, patient-reported experiences. This is the first sector we're working with. The second sector is this one, the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah? In essence, it's along the same lines where we become a matchmaking portal for clinical trials. But I could continue talking about this, and I'm more than happy to discuss this at the, uh, throughout the conference, but I want to leave you with something else. Because war on cancer is more than a technological platform. War on cancer is hope. And war on cancer is a place where people can unite, fighting something together. And there's a, I want to leave you with that. Cancer, it is incapable of any form of reasoning, and it grows stronger because we fear it. Going through cancer is an extremely lonely process. When I got diagnosed, I completely broke down, but I decided to post a message on Facebook to let my friends and family know. Hello my friends, family and followers. On the 1st of July, 
I was diagnosed with leukemia. For those of you who are not familiar with this term, it's blood cancer. The post was shared 13,000 times. I discovered there is a power in us sharing our stories. Sharing creates energy. Each story you read about reaffirms you're not alone. We have created the storytelling platform waroncancer.com for everyone who has their life touched by cancer. Our mission is simple, to make the world a better place for future generations of cancer warriors. This is the time when we can all come together and feel safe knowing that we are not alone in the fight. For my friend. This is from Nakasunet. Hello, my brother. Okay, this is for my friend in Hamburg. For my brother. This is for my mother. This is for my son. This is for my son. This is for my son. This is for my grandfather. For my grandmother. For my father. For my father. For my grandmother. For my grandmother. For my uncle. For my uncle. This is for my dear. For my friends. This is for my friend's dad. For my husband. For my husband. For my husband. For myself. This is a platform for all of us, because in the war on cancer, we are more powerful together. Thank you. Wow, great stories, thank you very much. Marie, I, I wanted to ask you a bit about, more about co-creation. Uh, at Rothbard University Medical Center, we are in our research center, we're working with co-creation ever since 2011, right from the first get-go, together with patients, families, and informal care. But we also know how hard that is, because as you said, there is no one patient. There's no one size fits all. So it also makes it very difficult at times to get all the different perspectives into play. So if you would have this magic wand kind of thing and talk not only to all the people in the audience, but also the administrators and the CEOs and the ministers, what would that be as a recipe from your end to really get co-creation in an equalized fashion into play? So I'm really glad you brought that up because this is something that has really been puzzling me and has been bothering me for years. We've got that we're are we building this two-tier healthcare system? So we've got patients who've got who are able to research online and who are able to get the latest app. And so we're building a super patient, an expert patient, and then what happens to everybody else? So I don't have the answer to that, but I do say to the audience again, we need to start having the answers to that. We cannot continue. The gap is getting wider and wider. We already have a, a gap um, in our healthcare services throughout Europe. We're not going to, I mean, it's, it upsets me so much to think that we're also creating this digital gap. Um, I don't have the answer. The only answers that ever came to me is that me, myself, I need to go into my communities. I need to work in libraries with pharmacists. You know, the local pharmacy, I'm, I'm, I don't know if we've got any pharmacists here, but I think sometimes we don't use or talk about them enough. So it's, it's embedding it in the community. So it's opening the doors of the universities, opening the doors of the hospitals, opening the doors and going out there into the community. And I believe so strongly, Lucien, that we need to start looking for these marginal, marginalized voices. And we need to start bringing that into the process as well. Um, but you know, we haven't even got co-creation right at, at, at a certain level. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I hate labels. I mean, I, I've kind of become where we're even, I just think that we labeling everything, even patient, you heard me, I stumbled over the word patient. Out of everything and the whole thing, I didn't think that would be the word I stumbled on. But I'm actually having even a problem with patient because I think when you stick a label, co-design, patient engagement, patient, I think people stop thinking sometimes. They go into a certain kind of an heuristic about it. So I think we need to start maybe working around that as, uh, as well. So I'm all about stripping it all back and let's start again. Let's start building it from the ground up again. Just let's, just let's reset it, okay. So there's also a bit of a real call in your, in your message where you say, quit that tokenism. Oh. And, and I do agree, 
it often starts with tokenism. Let's mm -hmm. be honest. Mm -hmm. The moment in time when you start addressing things, people pay lip services and they say, well, yeah, we got this patient on, on stage. And back in the early days when there were world, world, world West movies, the director should always had an Indian in the movie, so he would say, go get an Indian. <laughs> and we really have to make sure that that's not the case for together with patients, of course. But I do think that we gradually see improvement in all those aspects that patients are getting incorporated in all kinds of processes. I know in the Netherlands, and tomorrow I give a keynote together with Annemiek Fon from the Foundation Icone, they are being asked to help in almost every process in the redesigning in a lot of our hospitals in the Netherlands already. So it is taking off, but what would be the step to really, what could really boost that kind of energy that's needed for it? It's, it's, it's hard for a lot of patients to even come up to the hospital or to the GP practice or to the pharmacist to attend the meeting about changing whatever kind of thing. I mean, again, it's the same answer. We need to start getting back into the community. But I agree with you. I, I understand. But my personal experience has been there is still a lot of tokenism. There is still a lot. And it's with the best of intentions. I know nobody says, let's call up the token patient. I know nobody thinks like that. But I think we've become almost too comfortable with the terms. And we almost need to go back again and, as you say, reset it and talk about what is this really. And I believe so strongly we need to start valuing patients, not just by saying, come on in and have us. But actually, uh, it's a controversial thing talking about paying patients. But I think if you're paying, um, you know, if, if there's a certain level in research grants and all that you're paying, you need to start factoring in paying patients and start valuing them as the experts that they are. Um, so I know we're, again, we're kind of talking about two different sets of patients, which I don't feel comfortable with. But look, that's the reality. That's where we're at. And I hope this, this, um, the next few days is going to be something where we're going to really start having these conversations and see what we can do to start moving things in a different direction. Okay, thank you very much. Fabian, I can imagine that on your age, running into blood cancer, that brings a whole different other areas than, for instance, very uh, small age children's cancer or yeah. grown-up cancer, facing all kinds of different topics like employment, mortgages, yeah. and all kinds of stuff like that. So I really can imagine that you create also a platform for that, but why just alone cancer, forgive me the, the, the way I pronounce it. Why not broader? Because I could easily imagine that that could be helpful for a lot of other people as well. Uh, yes, uh, well, we could, I mean, <coughs> first of all, we decided to build War on Cancer because, yeah, it's my, it's my personal experiences. And uh, this is, in a way, uh, it's, it's very much a patient-driven uh, innovation. Uh, I mean, we, I, I saw the problems as a patient, and I decided to build something to solve the problems. But, but I want to get back to the, um, the co-creation uh, thing as well, because we considered, I mean, we could stop, like I said we, in, in the speech, we could stop uh, with with this platform and just let it let it live and, and hopefully help a lot of people. But I think we consider ourselves being about 70% done uh, because the rest of it we're going to do together with the industry because that's how we think that we can create something sustainable long term. And so right now we're doing um, interviews and um, workshops and focus groups together with the clinical trials experts from uh, pharma, real world evidence experts. Uh, health economics experts from pharma, as well as uh, doctors, nurses, and um, uh, patient data. Um, and this whole thing, what I wanted to come to is, uh, this whole thing takes a lot of time. And instead of just building, trying to do everything at once, we're starting with boring cancer. But also, I think cancer, even though, I mean, we could, for instance, have war on illness and just let everybody be there. I think there's a certain, uh, that's my personal feeling, there's a certain connection between people that have gone through cancer, which is something that we can build upon, uh, which is, I don't think the world is ready to feel that they're connected with every patient in the world yet. So we're building upon that. Hmm. Um, Maybe in the future. We, uh, yeah, we have the domains war on Alzheimer's so, uh, okay. and, and war on diabetes. It's just uh, we might need someone else to run the, <laughs> become the face of that. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this address. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Marie stays with me. Marie stays with me.